the invention of industrial milling came about and they discovered that we can mill a whole ton of flour and if we extract parts of the wheat berry, we can actually make a shelf stable flour. That's the history of how we got to where we are today with the all purpose flour. And the reason why it's so important to mill the grains fresh is because as soon as you break the grain apart, the nutrients and things inside of it start to deteriorate. So it is best to mill it fresh, bake the breads right away. After you bake it, it holds the nutrients in. My name is Lisa, mother of eight and creator of the blog and YouTube channel Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today we're going to be chatting with Kristen Nobles from Generation Acres Farm all about whole grains. She's been baking in her kitchen for her family of six with whole grains for, I believe she said 12 years now. Very, very knowledgeable on the topic. She actually made a book and a course on whole grain baking and how to do it, how to get started. She takes away a lot of your overwhelm if you're worried about how to start and then how to convert recipes, what recipes work with whole grains, if it's worth it, the economics behind it. She takes a lot of those questions and we talk about them in this episode, but then she's she's just very knowledgeable. And so I think this is something that a lot of you are going to get a lot out of. So let's join Kristen Nobles to talk about whole grains. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us to talk about whole wheat. We get a lot of questions about this and you just really seem to be an expert on how to make everything with 100% whole wheat. So let's start with you, your story, and then we'll get into why it matters to to have freshly milled whole grains for your breads. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting to be here. I've been following you for a really long time. But yeah, my name is Kristen. I am a homeschooling mother of four children. I've been married to my husband, Scott, for uh, 16 years now. And we actually bought 35 acres of raw land back in 2020. Oh, cool. And so uh, ever since then, we've, we've, we've been kind of developing it. We actually built a house out here. And so it's been a busy last few years here, but it's been fun sharing all of that over on Instagram and that that sort of a thing. We have enjoyed doing that. But yeah, that's a little bit about us. We're a Christian family, uh, again, homeschool. My husband does work outside of the home and I have um, online businesses that I run from home. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. We've been, I've been following you too for, I don't know, for a while and you've really niched into this whole wheat, which is such a needed area because a lot of people know that there's benefits, but it's difficult to know how to adapt recipes. And then they don't always turn out the same as using all purpose flour. So first let's get into why does it matter? Why would you say that it's important to freshly mill your own flour? Yeah. So uh, in order to explain this, I like to talk like give a little brief history lesson just about milling and sort of how we got to where we are today with the all-purpose flour that you find in the store. And so basically prior to the 1900s, if someone wanted to bake bread, they would take their wheat berries to the local mill and they would have it milled for them. They'd walk away with a sack full of flour. Uh, They'd go home and they would bake whatever it was that they were going to bake, you know, that day for their family, maybe for the week or whatever. And then obviously that wasn't very convenient for people. So having to go go down there and get it milled every time you needed it. So uh, around 1920, I believe it was, the invention of industrial milling came about and they discovered that We can mill a whole ton of flour, and if we extract parts of the wheat berry, we can actually make a shelf-stable flour. So part of the reason why you would need to take your wheat berries to the mill whenever you needed to make flour or bake breads is because when you crush the wheat berry, you actually... It's it, it's basically starts deteriorating uh, all the nutrients and things in the wheat berry itself. So it releases oils and things like that, and it results in a really nutrient dense flour. So there's tons of 
vitamins and minerals and protein and fiber and all kinds of good stuff in it, but it spoils very easily because of the fatty acids and like I said, the oil content in it. So they discovered if they took parts of it away, so there's basically, there's three parts to a wheat berry. There's the outer layer that you can see, which is the bran. And then there's the innermost part, which is the germ. And which is like the seed basically. And then there's the middle layer, which is the starchy, like carbohydrate part. That's what makes like the, it kind of light and fluffy. Um, and so basically by extracting the bran and the germ, they discovered that they could then just market this white flour to people and it would be shelf stable and they could ship it and obviously put it in grocery stores and things and people could just get their flour whenever they needed it and they didn't have to deal with the miller and all of that stuff. Unfortunately, when they did that, it caused some health issues. People were becoming deficient in things and it was causing diseases. So the health officials at the time were like, what's going on? Why all of a sudden are people dealing with these issues that they never had before? And uh, basically they, they traced it back to the new white flour that people were eating. So they weren't getting the vitamins and all the nutrients that they were used to getting from the nutrient dense whole grains that people were you know, used to having in their breads and things. So uh, the health officials said, hey, you guys need to go back to milling the whole thing and selling it, you know, the way that you used to. And um, unfortunately, the millers said, no, we, they already had another market for the brand and germ. So they were selling it to cattle farmers and pig farmers and things like that. So they were like, now we're making all this money and by selling some to the farms and then some to the people. And mm -hmm. so um, they were like, no, we're not going to do that. But they did agree to add back in some of the nutrients that are missing from the flour. So of the 25 to 30 nutrients that are pulled out by extracting the bran and germ, they agreed to put back in four, only four of the nutrients that would just try to help people to not get those diseases and things that were becoming kind of epidemic at the time. But of course, so that's where you get the enriched or fortified flour that you see in the store today. They've put vitamins and things back into it. But of course, it's not a real food source of vitamins. So whether or not our bodies can actually utilize it is probably another discussion for another day, but that is basically why it is so important or that's, that's the history, I guess, of how we got to where we are today with the all purpose flour. And the reason why it's so important to mill the grains fresh is because as soon as it, you break the grain apart, the nutrients and things inside of it start to deteriorate. So it is best to mill it fresh bake the breads that you're going to make right away. And that basically, after you bake it, it, it holds the nutrients in. So then you could take your loaves of bread and freeze it or whatever you need to do. But it basically locks in all those nutrients once you bake it. Yeah, and I'm sure too, after they tried to go back to the whole grains, people were used to these light, fluffy breads. And that's, you know, these days we have dough enhancers, we have bunny bread, and homemade bread, even when you, when you make it with an all-purpose flour, it doesn't turn out quite like that. And I think people are almost expecting yeah. it to be like that. And then when you have whole grain, even less so. So, you know, it's in some ways you have to get used to the difference before or re readjusting your expectations with how it's going to turn out. Have you found that to be the case or do you have some kind of magic secret that makes everything fluffier and lighter whenever it's made with whole grain? So I know I would say not, not any special secret, but I do know a lot of people say, how do you get it to not be so dense? And, you know, of course, I don't know what recipe they're using. There are a lot of factors that could go into that, like yeah. the mill, how fine you've ground it, of course, the type of wheat that you're using. But I'll say mine are not dense at all. And they they are fluffy. They don't look like, you know, the white flower that you see or pictures that you see on blogs and things like that. But they are light and airy and they're not dense. So I think it maybe just depends on the recipe that you're using, you know, making sure you get those good rises out of it, not moving to the baking too quickly, you know, but giving it ample time to rise. I think those all play a role, like I said, and then of course the type of wheat you're using and then maybe even your grain mill as well. So do you find that certain types of recipes work better with whole wheat? Like for example, I have found that if I add additional fat or eggs to the dough or some kind of, you know, fat or something to soften it helps a lot. And then 
It doesn't do as well on like a Dutch oven bake on really high temperatures. What what kind of recipes have you found? And then what what is the secret to how what kind of grain you use? And then also the setting. You mentioned how fine it is on your home mill. Yes. So I have found that the best so sandwich loaves are are my favorite thing to make with it. So yeah, that, yeah. I agree. I agree. Because those can actually be soft, even with all whole grain. Exactly. Yes. And it probably has to do with the fact that at least my recipes, they have honey in them and oil, Mm -hmm. olive, like a cold pressed olive oil in them. So I think that really helps with the softness and that sort of a thing. So that's definitely a favorite. Also, like yeasted breads, like I would say freshly milled flour shines in yeasted breads, in my opinion, I feel like just because you get that nice rise out of them. I use them in all and everything, you know, muffins, cakes, cookies, all of that. But I feel like they're lightest and airiest in the yeasted breads. And so like I said, sandwich bread, cinnamon rolls. I make a um, cinnamon raisin bread out of them that my kids and mm, husband I used to do that too with. all the time. Yes. They eat it every morning for breakfast. And if there isn't any on the counter, they're like, what, mom, what is happening? Like, is we, we need this. <laughs> yes. We need this bread. So it, it can be used, like I said, in all you know, forms, quick breads, yeast breads. But I, I feel like in the yeast application, you just get that nice rise Mm -hmm. and it's light and airy. Um, as far as baking in a Dutch oven, I really haven't had good luck with that. It's, it's not like, like, okay, a regular, uh, sourdough bowl where you do an all purpose flour, you do a little bit of whole grain flour, salt, water, and a sourdough starter. And then you do this really high heat with the lid on subbing that all out for a hundred percent whole grain. It works, but just not the best results. That's why on like one of my whole grain recipes, I do. I add in honey. I add in some fat, some oil, some butter because it makes, it just makes people like, well, why, why did you not make it? Or why did you have to add that? Or why did you have a lower temperature whenever you're doing it in the Dutch oven? And that's just because it just doesn't do the same thing. It just, yeah, I completely exactly. agree. Yeah, it just reacts differently for whatever reason. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's some great science behind all of it, but I've just Probably. learned it in my kitchen <laughs> like you have with a lot of experimentation. Yes. So also you mentioned the fineness of the grain. What is What kind of settings and what kind of mill are you using? Yeah, so I use the Wonder Mill. That's the one that I got. So I've been baking this way for 12 years. I don't think I mentioned this. Wow, I yeah. had some health issues uh, in my early 20s and it kind of led me down the road to natural living and a friend of mine introduced me to milling flour and I just jumped in and it's been really great for my health and so many things. But yeah, I I started with a wonder mill. And so I've had that for 12 years, never had a single issue with it. Everyone asks, what mill do you use? And there's fancy ones out there, beautiful, wooden one, all of that. And I know those work great as well. Uh, But this is what I, what I started with and it's worked perfectly for me. Uh, There are three settings on it. There's a coarse setting, a bread setting and a pastry setting. I pretty much keep it on the bread setting most of the time. And then if I'm doing a quick bread, something like a cookie or a cake, then I'll turn it to the pastry setting. Okay. But for the most part, I keep it just in the middle. And I find that's, you know, works great for the sandwich breads and all of that stuff. Okay. So whenever you write your recipes, like in your uh, course, And on your blog, you have tons of uh, whole grain recipes, I noticed on your blog. And I should have just clicked into one of them to see, but because there could be different settings, are you like, is it, do you just use cups or do you do you use some grams or how does that end up translating out? Because I've always just done cups, but I don't know if that works out or, oh, I see on this one you put at the pastry setting. So that's how you end up getting it like equal. Yes. A little bit more fine. Okay. And then usually I do tell people, yeah. you know, you just got to kind of play it by ear as you're going. So yeah. many people yeah. want to know the conversions I of know. it. And that's really hard. Trust me. I totally I, know. Because <laughs> yeah. this is something I go through on my blog all the time. I'm like, it's, it really is like, you just kind of get a feel for yes. it, you know, like, yes. Everyone wants this like formula, which there are, if you Google it, there are formulas like add this much more of the flour if you're subbing, you know, all purpose. But in my opinion, I haven't really found that it works very well. I feel like it depends 
so much. All the different grains have different moisture contents. I learned recently that it even depends on the region in which it was grown. So you could be buying a hard okay. red wheat from right. out west and it's different than the ones that mm. are grown, you know what I mean, in the Midwest. So yeah, it's, yeah. it is always changing. So I just tell people start with less flour and then if the if it looks too either if it's a dough, like a bread dough, if it's too sticky still, then add a little bit more flour or if it's something like a cake, if it's too runny, then add more flour or you just kind of adjust, like you said, and just kind of get to know it over time. Yeah. Well, like you said, if, if you're down to where you purchase it, where it's grown, then yeah, like you can never get it exact over where you are. All right. Taking a quick break from this episode to tell you about my brand new course, Simple Sourdough. This one has been a long time coming. I have shared about sourdough over on my blog and my YouTube channel forever, but I finally compiled all of the information that you need to be successful with sourdough, uh, the starter, making your first ever loaves of bread, using the discard, so many things in my course, Simple Sourdough. You can find it at bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough course. That's all one word, bit.ly by slash farmhouse sourdough course. The coolest thing about the new Simple Sourdough course is that there's a corresponding private Facebook group that is for students only. I'm really excited that that'll be a place where when you have specific questions, there'll be other students in there, sourdough enthusiasts, and we can all learn from each other. This is usually such a valuable asset because a lot of times you'll have a specific question that you don't want to filter back through the course for. It's all there, but sometimes you just want other people who are on the same journey as you and I'm really excited to provide that course, which just the lifetime membership comes with the purchase of the Simple Sourdough course. Again, you can find that at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse sourdough course. So with that being said, what are some of your favorite grains to use for pastries, for bread? What types of grains do you go for? Yeah. So for my, my favorite, like I said, sandwich loaves, things like that, or, um, cinnamon raisin bread or cinnamon rolls, things of that nature. Basically for yeast breads, I go for the hard wheat varieties. So I like to blend hard red and hard white together for a lot of those. I feel like that's just like a really nice mix. I like the hard red has kind of a stronger flavor and maybe some people mm-hmm, wouldn't like yep. that, but I actually really like that in the baked goods and my kids and family do, do too. So I end up mixing that half and half for most of my yeast bread recipes. And then for the quick breads, I use the soft white wheat. So quick breads being things that you use baking soda and baking powder in like cakes, cookies, mm-hmm. pancakes, waffles, things like that. I will go for the, the soft white and so many people love to talk about ancient grains. It's like, you know, a popular thing right now. And so spelt (laughs) is one of my favorites for that. It's actually one of the more versatile ancient grains that I know of because it Mm -hmm. is great in either application, yeasted breads or quick breads. And so it's a really great one that I love to keep on hand for any time. Basically, like I said, for any of those, those applications, I have done a little bit of kamut and I've done some einkorn. Both of those have great flavor, but they, they oftentimes in yeasted breads, they need to be combined with a hard wheat because Mm -hmm. they are lower in protein. So they have a harder time forming the gluten structure and things in the bread. Mm -hmm. So those end up needing to be paired. So I don't reach for those as often. I do keep them around, but just because they store so easily for so long, I don't reach for those as much, even though they are some of the more popular ones. Everyone loves einkorn and uh, Uh kamut. (laughs) Yes. So to get very specific, where do you get these grains? I I forget where you're from. Where are you from again? Which area? Yeah, Virginia. We're in Virginia. Okay, so you're on the east. So um, yeah, where are you sourcing this stuff? So you probably go to the Amish community, don't you? <laughs> I don't. I wish we had oh, really? someone close by. Yeah, we don't. I totally would. I remember when you used to talk about go- getting things from the Amish community. Mm-hmm. I think maybe in your old last house or, and um, yeah, more so than we have yeah. to drive further now. Yes. Yeah. So I was, was always so jealous. I'm like, oh, I would love to be able to go mm-hmm. do that and support <laughs> them. But anyway, Azure Standard is my favorite. I've found it's okay. the cheapest. It's really clean. 
I really do. That's it. But if you don't have a drop in your area, uh, Amazon actually has some decent organic options. So at times really? when, I yeah, to look there. they do. Yeah. And you, you know, of course, I mean, it's really the, the price comparison is not that different from Azure. Azure is a little bit cheaper, but I've had great luck on Amazon. And then uh, a long time ago when I first got into this before I knew anything about Azure and probably didn't even have Amazon at the time, uh, I used to go to a local health food store and they would order it in bulk for me. Oh, wow. So they would get, yeah. Yeah. So I would check the, you know, a local health food store if you don't want to ship it in. Uh, Azure, Azure standard is great. And then Amazon as well. Yeah, Luke actually is um, heading over to our Azure Standard pickup like as we speak right now. So we get tons of grains from them, not only for us, but then also for our animals. So there'll be a lot of 50 pound bags. So with that, do you purchase it like in what quantity and then how do you store them? Yes. So I buy the big like 50 pound bags at a time. Typically, Uh, some of the other grains that I mentioned that I don't use as much, I'll get the smaller bags like 25 pounds. And I store them in food grade buckets and put them in like they need to be kept in temperature controlled. So I put them in like clo- bottoms of closets and things like that. And so, yeah, I buy the big old bags and a 25 pound bag will fit in a five gallon food grade bucket, which you can actually get the food grade buckets from Azure or Tractor Supply is where I get a lot of them just because we have one close yeah. by. So yeah, yep, so I store them mm-hmm. in there and I keep a lot on hand, especially over the last couple of years when things have just continued to climb in price. It seemed like every time we needed to buy more grain, we were going up a bit and my husband was like, we know you're going to be making these breads, so let's just stock up. So instead of stockpiling other things that people were doing, rice and beans and whatever, we just stockpiled grain. So we have tons and tons of grain in the bottoms of our closets and things and it stores perfectly just like that for like pretty much as long as you could want it to. So. Yeah. 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 And you can do things to make them store even longer than just in a bucket, but I've always found that just in a bucket is long enough for me because I will go through it in probably like definitely less than five years. If I even stock up majorly, we can go through a 50 pound bag faster than like a lot faster than that. So Yeah, I agree. They've never really gone bad for us. So Azure Standard, are you ordering the organic off of there typically? And is that important to you? And for for what reason? Yes. Yeah, it's very important to me. I try to stick with organic through all as much as I can, (laughs) but it's not always possible. But I definitely think organic in the grains is super, super important to avoid all those chemicals and things that get sprayed on them. And it's not even just the really comment, you know, the glyphosate or whatever, it is also things that they use to chemicals that they spray to help it ripen, I guess, faster. I'm not sure the word for that, but basically to get the grains to come ready to harvest quicker. Mm -hmm. So they spray another chemical on it for that. So lots of things in the wheat industry that we don't want in our bodies um, and in the breads and things that we're we're making at home. So I definitely value organic for sure. I wouldn't recommend buying conventional. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So lots of questions about how to convert all-purpose recipes to freshly milled. Is that something you even recommend or do you typically just reach for recipes that are made specifically with freshly milled in mind? So I think it is great if you can find a recipe. I know your blog is a wealth of recipes. I'm still working on bulking up uh, what I have on mine. And I have like a little recipe book too that's separate. So I I think if you can get uh, recipes that you like that are already converted for you, of course, that is the easiest route to go. But it really isn't difficult to convert from all purpose. Like I mentioned, everyone wants a formula and people will say, you know, add a half a cup. Like if you're, if it calls for three cups of all purpose, then add a half a cup of the freshly milled flour. But again, I just find that it's not always right. And if you just go with that and you complete what you're doing and then you realize, oh, this is really sticky or, oh, this is way too dry. I much prefer, like I I mentioned, just 
cut back a little bit. So if it says three cups of all-purpose flour, I would start with two and a half cups of freshly milled flour and just look at it and see what it looks like. So if it's a yeasted, like some sort of bread or something, then you want it to not be too sticky and you want it to be pulling away from the sides of the bowl and be pretty easy to knead if you're kneading it by hand. And if you're looking at a quick bread, like a cake or something, you're wanting that runny batter, but not too runny. So if you need to add a little bit more than you can. So I, it's, it's typically not enough to warrant a change in the salt or any of the other things in a recipe, if that makes sense. So it's, it's usually just a little bit. So it's not like, oh, I added a half a cup of flour. Now I need to increase the salt and the oil and the sugar. I haven't found that to be the case. I think you just kind of play with it a little bit and you'll figure it out. Yeah. If you were to sub something like one for one with a bread, would you recommend the, I think a lot of people want like the basics. It's the hard white or a combination of the two different hard red and hard whites, correct? I feel like I've done that a lot. I feel like I have done a lot of just one for one and it works out good enough. You know, like there probably is Mm -hmm. sometimes something to be desired, but it's definitely good enough and edible. Yes, that's exactly what I would do. I would mix the two 50-50 for sure. Yeah. And then if it was a quick bread, then I would use that soft white flour or soft white wheat on the pastry setting and then sub that one for one too. But again, just kind of mess with it and see, get it the right consistency. Awesome. Okay. So also lots of questions about making your own all-purpose flour. I've been curious about this and a friend of mine forget what it was, but she had some kind of sifter thing where if you want to do all freshly milled flours, but you do still want to have a lighter product for certain different things, maybe like a guest coming over for a birthday party. I don't know what, but you want to do all purpose. Have you experimented with that? Like removing the bran on your own? Right. I, I have never removed the bran. I've just always been able to make whatever it is with the truly whole grain flour, but there are people who do, and you can definitely get a sifter and sift out the bran and some of the germ, um, and it will result in a lighter, a lighter flour. And then I think I saw another question someone was asking or saying that she sifted hers because the, her kids weren't that into the extra bran, I guess, the flavor or whatever in the in her breads, and she was asking what she could do with it. And I know a lot of people will use it for muffins, so bran muffins is or something that oh, are yeah. popular you've probably heard of before so that is a way that you could if you were going to sift it instead of just tossing it i guess if you live on a homestead i'm sure chickens or something would eat it right yeah <laughs> but if not then you could use it in some sort of muffin recipe something like that yeah yeah i used to for the first i'd say at least 10 years that i was a homemaker I did everything, all whole grain. I bought grains in bulk. I had my my mill and that was the most economical way and the healthiest way to do it. And then lately I buy so much all-purpose flour also because I'm exp- I'm doing like a lot of recipe testing for my blog and my book and people, it's just easier to teach people starting with all-purpose. And then sure, yeah. at some point, you know, it's, it's nice when you're well-versed in whole grains to to feed your family with that. But uh, yeah, I find myself stocking up a lot of all purpose and I've gotten really used to how it works and I really like the results. So it's tricky because I do always add some whole grain to everything or to most things, but I find myself using a lot of all purpose. So I probably should figure out how to make that uh, myself. I get it from Azure Standard, so it's still a good deal. Yes. And I get organic, but yes. Yeah. I should figure out how to how to do that. So if people are wondering if that's like people have asked me, do you make all your own all purpose? And I definitely do not do that. Yes. Yeah. I have never, never done that, but I've heard that you can. So <laughs> Okay. So you mentioned all the health benefits of whole grain. And sometimes there's conflicting information on that. And somebody asked, is the freshly milled flour harder to digest? Have you heard anything like that? Or have you came across the phytic acid and neutralizing that and I don't know if you're familiar with all of that, but that's been something that's given me like yes. some hesitation on even knowing if it's all worth it. Yes, I totally understand. And yes, it is something that I have looked into because I have heard people talk about the phytic acid and, oh, it's an anti-nutrient mm-hmm. and you're doing bad things to your body by consuming things with this in it. 
And a few years ago, it gave me pause. I was like, wait, right? is this right? Like, is what I'm doing right? So I really looked into it, like I said, a few years ago and read some different articles and things about it. And um, from what I can gather, it's there's a uh, several different... Or, uh, a lot of different things have phytic acid in them. I think in kale right. and spinach, some other vegetables and things oh, yeah, have yeah. it. It's not as bad as what people think it is, I guess. Okay. And some yeah. more recent studies have shown that uh, it actually is beneficial to your body and okay. can help get, what's the word? The chemical, like, free radicals like anti- or yeah. Okay. Yeah, things like that out of your body, things that cause issues. So I actually wrote down some notes about it and... Let me see here. I mean, it would make sense to me that God made the grain how it's supposed to be used. I will say that originally when people were making most things, we didn't have, you know, packets of yeast. They were a slower process. And so probably the solution is you mill it yourself and you do sourdough or you sprout. You do that traditional method of preparing it. That would be like the ultimate. But then also grains are different now too. So probably the ultimate is take an ancient grain, mill it, sourdough it. That's what you should do. (laughs) If you're really going fully for health, that's what you should do. Yes, exactly. Yes, it seems like that is probably the most ideal. But some recent studies and things have shown that the um I wrote some notes. Let me see. It's it says it's increasingly recognized as a powerful antioxidant that can bind with heavy metals and prevent the formation of damaging free radicals. So this is an article that Sue Becker wrote. She's really big into the whole grains. And so basically it can have it's there are some protective properties and things of phytic acid and phytase in the body that I think maybe we it it, there needs to be more research mm-hmm. done on it. But from what I understand, I think it's a little misunderstood. Yeah. And it's not what people think that it is because no one talks about, you know, soaking kale or whatever and or, you know, whatever it is. I can't remember which one it is that also has it. But people don't talk about that. You know, you're supposed to eat all your greens and all of this stuff. We're not worried about it there. But also, in addition to that, baking reduces the phytic acid and then the rising with the yeast reduces it as well. Okay. So okay. it's not, and it's, you know, and, and there's such a small amount in there that it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like it does what people think it it might do. So I mean, I'm definitely not going to feel guilty about buying an organic whole grain, milling it, and then making my family a baked good from it. Like common sense just leads me to not like really question that in general. I think that's something that, you know, I, I've, I've been over the years way too into researching every little thing. And then just being like, I make, I'm making this with good ingredients and we're going to, we're going to be there. That's where we're going to stay. Right. And then it's also so economical with whole grains It's the most economical way to feed your family because of buying it in bulk. Once you invest in a mill, it's the cheapest way that you can do it. It really is. Yeah. I had someone recently ask, uh, they had joined my course and they said, well, how much is it? I need to convince my husband that I can buy this grain mill. And she said, how much is it per loaf? You know, what is it? And I was like, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I never have actually, you know, looked into that. I just Sounds like something for your homeschool kids to figure out, right? (laughs) Yeah, I should have done that. I should have. (laughs) But I was so surprised how inexpensive a loaf of sandwich bread was. So this is a honey whole wheat sandwich bread that I use. It's kind of a basic dough recipe that I use for a lot of different things. And so it does have honey in it and olive oil, but it's $1.50 per loaf. And it's a decent you know, a decent, it's not like a grocery store loaf, you know, one of those big giant ones, but it's you yeah, know, probably like one like pound or two pound. Size. Yeah, exactly. I think it's about one pound. Um, and it was a dollar fifty per loaf. And that's with me buying the grains in bulk from Azure mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. The most expensive part of it, I think, was the olive oil, which yeah. I also get from Azure, cold pressed, organic, trying right, to do the best right. I can with the oils. So yeah, a dollar fifty. I'm like, you can't, you can't get that from the grocery store. And it's, the most you can buy junk thing. from the grocery store for that <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. But if you're yeah. trying to buy like Dave's Killer Bread or Ezekiel Bread or yes. one of those like that have not questionable ingredients in it, they're six bucks. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think in our area they're like seven or eight dollars for the Dave's Killer Bread, and you mm-hmm. know it's the ingredients are fairly clean, but 
it doesn't. It taste still has good. to be shelf stable. <laughs> has to be shelf stable. Well, no, it also yeah, it doesn't flavor. Taste good. A lot yeah. of times it's frozen. True. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. For for practical reasons. But yeah, if it's if something is on the shelf and it doesn't, it's not sitting in the freezer like Ezekiel bread. There's a reason for that. Like there's something in it that is questionable that allows that to be possible. Because like you mentioned, once you mill a grain, it quickly starts losing not only the nutritional value, but then also it starts breaking down. And so if something is sitting there, there's got to be something in it that's keeping it from going bad. All right, let's talk natural skincare. I've shared on here about Tubes & Co. so many times but that is because I can't stop talking about them. I genuinely love it. My sisters and I were always texting, who's making an order? Add this to your order. You know, we combine so we can all get free shipping. My mom, we all love their makeup and their skincare. So today I happen to only be wearing mascara and the eyebrow pencil, but I love the foundation. I have the palette for eyeshadow so many of their products. I love them all. So I have completely switched my makeup over to Tubes & Co. Which is saying something because natural skincare that has high quality ingredients, uh, tallow from grass fed cows, nothing synthetic, nothing uh, on the list of things that you don't want to put on your skin. It's hard to find stuff like that that actually works and makes you feel like you have makeup on. And I have found that in Tubes & Co, which is why I love sharing it. I also love their cleansing oil and their moisturizing creams. The tallow balm is my favorite. I have it sitting over uh, bedside so I can put it on at night, especially this time of year as my skin gets dry. I rely on that to continue not feeling like sandpaper. Tubes & Co is a family run company. I actually know their owner and she is just awesome, Emily Tubes. We text back and forth sometimes and I support everything they're doing. So if you are looking to clean up your skincare routine, clean up your makeup, Tubes & Co is offering Simple Farmhouse Life listeners 10% off your order with the code FARMHOUSE. So you can head over to tubesandco.com, that's T-O-U-P-S and co.com. Use the code FARMHOUSE. I know that you're going to love their products as much as we do. Okay, one question that we had in the outline that I was curious to get your take on is what's the difference between freshly milled and then what what's the whole grain from the store? Because it is sitting on the shelf. So what is that? Yes. So from what I understand, that is grain that has been processed and they, they do pull the bran and germ out of it, but then they put a little bit back into it. And I, I don't know if they treat it in some way. I don't it know. must do something. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing to make it shelf stable because it's not really possible for it to be. So uh -huh. they, there's yeah. not a lot of Brandon germ in it. I know that. I know they don't put all of it back in there because like I said, it's impossible to get a truly whole grain and have it be shelf stable. So that that's from what I understand. That is what it is at the store. And so there are people who okay. will say, can I just start with that? And I would say, sure, you can start with that. But like I mentioned before, the nutrients and things, the whole purpose behind this is to get all those nutrients and vitamins and minerals into your family, mm -hmm. right? And so by you can learn how to make bread with the whole grain from the store, but you're not getting the vitamins and nutrients and things because as soon as the wheat berry is crushed, it begins to deteriorate and oxidize and those vitamins and minerals and things are lost like over a 24 hour period, I believe it is. So it's pretty quick that it needs to be used mm -hmm. afterwards. So yeah. 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 Have you tried sprouting the grains before milling? So I have not. I looked into it during the time when people were talking about phytic acid a few years ago when I mentioned it and I was like, oh no, this is not good. I looked into it and it is something that you can do. You can sprout the wheat berries. The trick with it is that you have to make sure it is fully dehydrated because if right. you put grains that are wet at all in your milk. That's what I always wondered. Like, how does that work? Yeah. So 
I lo- I was trying to figure out how to do it in my oven and I'm sure it is possible, but it would take a really long time. So then I thought, oh, well, I'll get a dehydrator. And then before I knew it, I was this like- turning into like a 10 step process. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I was like, wait, is this even really needed? Like people have been eating bread like this for centuries. Like it, it's probably okay. So I kind of dropped it at that point, but you can sprout them. And then I would recommend dehydrating in an actual dehydrator just to make sure that it really- f- is completely dry. And then as long as it's completely dry, you can mill it and then you would have sprouted whole grain bread. But I've not tried that. I mean, you don't really need to do that and sourdough. So true. that sounds way more intimidating to me than sourdough. Agreed, so if yeah. you are concerned about that, you could just sub out the yeast in the recipe for like a half cup of sourdough starter and call it a day. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. I loved your post. I don't know if it was a recent one, but how to convert any recipe to sourdough. I think that was probably so helpful for so many people. Um, Really just broke it down nicely. Yeah. Yeah. You can just use the yeast in that form as opposed to in the packet. Either way, you know, it's pretty much the same process. Yeah. So for sure. Okay. People want to know where to get started. So what are all of the things that you need? If somebody has never done this before, maybe they're intimidated by buying in bulk or the equipment necessary the recipes, afraid they're not going to use it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So to get started, of course, the most important thing is going to be the mill. You do need the mill. The, uh, I mentioned the wonder mill, which is the one that I have. Another really popular one is called Nutra mill. They're about the same price point. There are also some stone mills that I don't personally have experience with, but a lot of people really like those. So that's an option as well. I do have links and things to these. I have like a little free guide that people can get if anyone is interested and it has just direct links to all these things that I'm mentioning, um, or I could give them to y'all. I don't know if you put them in the notes. Yeah, we can put them in the whatever you want to do. Okay. So you'll need the mill. And then of course the wheat berries, we talked about where to source the wheat berries. Uh, If you're looking to start with a smaller amount, Amazon is a great place to do that. So you can get 20 pound bags, something like that. And they're, I I think last I checked, they're maybe around 30 or $40 for something like that. Organic, hard red, hard white wheat just to get started with some, with a, a smaller amount. So the wheat berries, definitely an important part as well. And then from there, you need to figure out how you actually want to make the bread. So let's assume it's like a sandwich bread that you're going to make. So you could use a bread maker for that. So there is a specific brand of bread maker that has these special settings that you can actually customize and change it. And that helps a lot with freshly milled flour because it acts differently than all purpose. So if you just got kind of a general bread maker, sometimes it won't always work with the freshly milled, but there's a certain brand, like I said, that has this customizable option. That's what I use if I'm in a time crunch because you can throw everything in and push start, walk away, and you come back like two and a half hours later to a nice big two pound loaf of bread that's finished. Mm, yeah. So yeah, that's a great option for people who are really busy. But many people already have a KitchenAid mixer in their kitchen. So that's a great way to start. You can make about two loaves in an average KitchenAid mixer. A mixer is also an option. Um, you can, if you want, if you have a larger family or you want to make more loaves at once, then a larger mixer like a Bosch or an Anka Shroom is one that a lot of people like. I have both of those and I they work great. I can make like five or six loaves at a time with that. So one of those options, either a bread maker or a KitchenAid or a larger mixer will be needed. You can do it by hand. I talked to someone recently who said, I don't I don't have any of this stuff. I don't have space for these things in my kitchen. So I'm doing it all by hand. So that is possible too. It'll just take a little bit longer, but those are the main things that you need. Otherwise it's just, you know, simple ingredients like the olive oil and honey and, and things like that yeast and salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're going to continue to bake, this is all going to come out over time. I remember back when we first, I got my first mixer, my first grain mill, this was when our income was very, very low. And I wasn't, I was very frugal and I mean frugal. And still it made sense to me to purchase those things. And I did. I purchased those things very early on. And I I know that they paid themselves off for sure. Basic investments. If you, you know, you you have to continue to do it for it to pay off. But if you're going to do this for the next 10 years, and a lot of these tools, like I was just looking at your 
resource list over on generationacresfarm.com, like your whole resource list for milling wheat plus baking breads at home. They're, they're products that are made to last. So you have on there like those different mills and the mixers and whatnot. Those those have, have lasted me like a decade. I ended up getting the one up for my countertop and I had various reasons for that, but it, none of them were because the Nutrimilk wasn't working, <laughs> honestly. Okay, yes, yes. So mostly like aesthetic things. Yes. It all is stuff that's that's made to last and will be an investment, especially if you're a young homemaker and yes. you know, this is going to be something you're going to do for years to come, expand your knowledge. Yes. Yeah. On yeah. that note too, talking about it, them being made to last, I mentioned that I've had my mill for 12 years and the mixer that mm-hmm. I started with was a Bosch mixer, but it actually was my husband's, so my mother-in-law, my husband's mother, she had it when he was a kid. And she used to actually mill grains too, which is funny. I found out about milling grains kind of on my own. And then when I talked to her about it, she was like, oh yeah, I used to do that. that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's funny. And so uh, anyway, she gave me her Bosch mixer. So it is, I don't know, 25, 30 years old or something. And I still was using it. Yeah. So definitely made to last. Yeah. And also I am sure you could probably find a lot of this over on Facebook marketplace, like somebody who thought they were going to do all this and then it sat in the closet of the pantry for 10 years and they decided they couldn't. Uh, That's, I mean, you might even see it over at Goodwill. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely possible. I got my bread maker off of Facebook marketplace and I, anyone who is like, this is too expensive. I say, check your local Mm -hmm. Facebook marketplace and even not local. Some people will ship it to you too. So if you want to get a grain mill, I've seen the, I know the bread makers I've seen for around a hundred dollars very frequently. The brand is Zoho Rushi that has the special custom settings. And then the mills I see all the time. They're not a hundred. They're a little bit more than a hundred, but that's a pretty, pretty big savings there. So I, I, I would have no problem shopping off of Facebook marketplace for things like that. As long as you can try it out and make sure it, it works well. Yeah. They're just such true. quality. Actually. The mills are just made so well that I, I don't think it'd be a problem at all to get it used. Mm-hmm. I agree. Okay. Tell us all about your course and where we can follow you, where you put out some recipes. I do see that you do have quite a few whole grain recipes over on your blog. Yeah. So I do have them over on my blog. I'm I have a whole bunch that I'm waiting to put up. So I'm always putting more up there. I switched my focus a little bit to the course and then my recipe book there. So I haven't been Mm -hmm. as consistent over there, but yes, I do. I am over there on the blog. It's generationacresfarm.com. And then more recently over on Instagram, a lot more that's at generationacres.farm. And so over there, I share a ton about freshly milled flour and I share recipes and things like that. Through the years, as I've shared, a lot of people ask for classes and things like that. It just wasn't something that I felt like I could do at this season in my life. Uh, But I did know I've been filming YouTube videos for seven years now. So I do know how to do that. So I thought, okay, I can film videos. So uh, over the last six months, I filmed all the entire process, walking through all the steps of milling grains, all the way from the beginning of how to choose a grain mill, how to choose which method is best for your family, whether that's the, if you want to invest in like a bread maker or a mixer, uh, I talk all about that. And then just step-by-step videos of exactly how to mill the grains and exactly how to make all the breads and cinnamon rolls and all sorts of things over there. That includes the recipe book that has all my recipes already converted. Oh, so you have all the recipes milled. in there. Yes. Yes. You oh, can okay. you can get the recipe book separately if you, you know, already do this and you don't need the instruction. Um, but I do have all my recipes over in the course. And then we have a Facebook group as well where people can ask questions and post photos and things of their uh, successes and failures and whatever um, over there. So it's been a lot of fun getting to know people and just being able to share something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah. And you have so much knowledge on like you, it seems like you've been doing this for a really long time and have a lot of experience troubleshooting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have been doing it for a long time. It's something I really, really enjoy and I do enjoy sharing it with other people as well. And then I didn't mention we are on YouTube as well. So uh, we're Generation Acres Farm over there. So we share mostly just 
farm, homesteading things, a little bit about what we have going on here. But those are the places that you can find me. Awesome. And we will leave a link in the show notes for the course, for your blog and everything. I think like your your hub is generationacresfarm.com. So if you want to remember something just yes. to go to, you can find it all there. Yes. Awesome, Kristen. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge. I'm sure you've given a lot of people a lot to think about. Yeah, for sure. It was so much fun to get on here and, and chat about something that I love. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for listening to this episode. Kristen did tell me after we wrapped up the interview that she did make a coupon code for Simple Farmhouse Life listeners. So you can use code farmhouse over on her course page. So if you go either to her Instagram, Generation Acres Farm, she has a link to her course called the Freshly Milled Bread Course and use code farmhouse to get it for, I believe she said $39. So that's really affordable. We were chatting afterwards and she was saying that she had several people review the course. They told her to sell it for a lot more, but she thought she could help a lot more people at that price. So I think that's a pretty generous price. And if you're wanting to get started with whole grains, I think that it would be a good investment. So As always, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life Podcast.